1995. Adelaide's 5AA. Everything Adelaide. The news and issues that matter. Belinda Hegan. Eight minutes past uh, three o'clock. Great to have your company as always as we head into the final hour of Adelaide Afternoons for this uh, Wednesday. The sun is still poking through those grey clouds. Good to see. Now, in 2010, I was actually in Sydney working uh, in the media there. So I was a bit at arm's length, if you like, from the, uh, the win of Rachel Sanderson over a very formidable opponent in the seat of Adelaide against uh, Dr Jane Lomax-Smith. Uh, and with only six months to go, can you believe it, until we have our own uh, state election here in South Australia, we thought we would get in uh, some of those members from both both political parties or all political parties so that we can get to know who we may be voting for come March next year. Rachel Sanderson, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Belinda. Can you take me back to 2010? As I say, I wasn't here in Adelaide. It was a huge, uh, a huge win for you. What a 14% swing. Yes, it was. It was um, unexpected. It certainly, it was always my intention to win. When I set out to do something, it's because I think I can win and I have something to, to offer. But I, I thought that I would win probably with the final count by a couple of hundred votes after the postals were counted. So it was a big shock to win by such a margin. What do you think, what do you put that down to? Well, I think there were a lot of factors. I was very lucky um, in my electorate, um, the Liberals policy for the brand new stadium yes. was very popular. The policy to keep the Royal Adelaide Hospital site where it is, the existing hospital, which would have saved a billion dollars. And also we had a policy for a second campus of Adelaide High School. So the Liberal policies were certainly preferred in my electorate, as well as Jane was made a minister from day one of um, becoming a member of parliament. So I think that she missed out on the opportunity to be really in her electorate. So I've had three and a half years so far of being a backbencher where I can really get to know everyone in my electorate and go to all of the grassroots things, all the historical societies and the Friends of the Library and all the Probus Clubs and really get out into the community and find out what they want. So I did that also as a candidate and I think that was certainly part of the success along with the Liberal brand and there was a swing to the Liberal Party as well statewide. So I was very fortunate that everything came together for me on that day. You were the owner of a very successful modelling agency called Rachel's and a few of my friends from school actually went through the, the agency. Why did you want to leave that and the security of that for politics? Well, I think the, the turning point for me was the 2007 federal election when um, John Howard lost and we were faced with Labor governments federally and in every state. And although I'd had no contact with the Liberal Party previously and no real interest in politics, it was more than I could take. It was basically, I felt that our country was heading for disaster, that economically it would be a big disadvantage to have Labor governments at state and federal level, levels. And I thought, I've got two choices. I can sit back at home and complain, or I can get out there and do something about it. So I thought I love my, my city and my state too much to just watch it... Um, be destroyed in my in my mind and I thought I've had at that time 15 years in business I was a qualified accountant and I felt that I had a lot that I could give my community I'd been living in the prospect area since 1983 I'd had a business in the Adelaide City Council area since 1994 so I felt that that was my true home and my heart was in that electorate and I want to do everything I can for my community what is happening within the boundaries of the seat of Adelaide at the moment? Lots of redevelopment. With that comes some problems. What are your main concerns at the moment? Well, the main concerns at the moment is the lack of parking. Now, I know that the Lord Mayor always says how there's more parks per capita and in Adelaide, but you wouldn't know it. And from talking to anyone, for example, with the Rundle Mall redevelopment, if all the people I surveyed, and I have done electorate-wide surveys twice, you ask them what they would do to improve Rundle Mall and they say cheaper parking. Mm. So parking is, is a big button for people going into the city. There's also been parking issues around the Women's and Children's Hospital. I first visited the hospital in May of 2010. By 10 o'clock when I came out, the car park was full. So I already 
could tell that there's a parking issue. And since then, we've had lots of contact with not only staff, but patients that are parking, you know, kilometres away mm. with children with oxygen tanks or, you know, prams and they've got multiple children that are very mm. ill. It's just not acceptable to have these issues going on. So the Adelaide Oval being built without adequate parking uh, means that there is even more more um you know strain on the limited car parking so are you in favor of of creating or, or a new car park near the women's and children's hospital i am um firstly i think that when the oval was expanded there was a big opportunity to have underground car parking and i think that's a missed opportunity now which is you know a terrible shame that that wasn't done and thought of up front so there is already a hospital car park opposite the Women's and Children's Hospital. And I think that there is potential for that to be expanded. I've spoken to engineers that were involved in the original build. I believe it's been expanded once and it is safe to expand again. And there's the potential of even expanding the car park across over the roadway towards the hospital. So it's even, even bigger, like a, a walk through. And apparently there is a need for some more doctors, studios and things. So potentially, there could be an investor that um, has some money. Car parking, I believe, has a very good rate of return. I know that the state government doesn't have any money for expanding car parks. However, I really don't think the car park should be sold. I think that it should be held by the state government. Um, providing adequate health services also means providing access to those health services for not only the patients but the staff. So if the Liberal Party win government next March, what is your commitment regarding extra car parks in, in the Adelaide city area or, and North Adelaide? Well, we, we don't have a released policy at this stage, but certainly I have been very vocal in our party room that the hospital car park needs to be expanded and there needs to be other options considered. It doesn't have to be state government money. There are certainly plenty of um, private people with money that are more than happy to invest in, in car parks because they do make a lot of money. Rachel Sanderson, the uh, member, state member for the seat of Adelaide, my guest in the studio this afternoon. She's taking your calls too. So if you live or work in uh, in the seat, which covers obviously the CBD and North Adelaide uh, and environs, 8223 is the number, or you can text in 1399 1395. As we all know, the federal uh, coalition is now government, has been sworn in this morning. Much has been made of Julie Bishop being the only only uh, inner cabinet minister who is a female, 19 other men, one female. What's your view on that? Well, my view is that people should always be chosen on their merit. Um, the right person should be chosen for the right job. I think it's irrelevant whether you're a male or female. And um, I, I would want the best team uh, leading my country. And whether that happened to be all men or all women, it wouldn't bother me at all. See, I agree with the merit argument. I just find it sad that in this day and age, uh, Tony Abbott couldn't find any other women to put in the inner ministry. Well, I think there are other women coming through, and there's certainly, I believe, four other women in the, or five in the outer ministry, so they are coming through. And there are a lot of new women that have just been elected. So after a few years, there'll be a lot more depth of women that will have the skills. Anne Rustin from South Australia, a senator, she's been in for around a year now and she's amazing and I, I believe that she will progress through the ranks um, rather quickly because she has talent. But I think people should get there when they're ready and when, when their skills are at the right level to take on the position. I heard uh, Jamie Briggs, who has um, been sworn in, I think, in the outer ministry this afternoon or this morning, he, he was on radio suggesting that it can be harder for women because they need to take a break or they sometimes do take a break um, to have babies and what have you. You're obviously um, very high up in the ranks in the Liberal Party here in South Australia. Have you found it hard? being a woman here get, getting through the ranks of the Liberal Party? I haven't found it difficult at all being a female but to be honest I have thought about how difficult my job would be if I had children. Um, I'm out at least four nights a week and on, on a weekend I could have between two and six functions. If I had children I don't know when I'd actually get to see them mm. so if you were a female with children you would have to have a very supportive husband that liked cooking, was available to pick children up from school because our job is very demanding and um, I really don't know how, how the women with children cope and I think at the federal level 
being away half of the year in Canberra, how difficult that would be mm. with children. Again, if you've got a supportive husband, it's no different than, than the man having a, mm. a job. But um, yeah, Perhaps it's difficult. not a job that is conducive to having a young family. I don't think it is. Mm. And if you think about it, I don't think there are many women with young families in, in politics. And I think it's their choice because who would choose it, really? Laurie's on the line. Hello, Laurie. I'm just going to ask, uh, invite Rachel to pop on some headphones. Yeah. Angie might help you with that as we, uh, there we go. Great. Sorry, Laurie. We've Sorry, got you Rachel. now. Bit of a query. Bike lane. The I'm a motorist and the bike lane can absolutely bang all motorists. Can you say that a bit louder, Laurie? We're having trouble hearing you. Hang on a second. I'll take off. Uh, can you hear me now? That's much better. Thank you. Bike lane. They're the absolute bane of motorists. Now, originally, when the bike lanes were first brought in, they were meant to be off main road, not on the main road, and not constrict the traffic flow. Well, now you've got them on the main road everywhere, and in the city, it is an absolute pain in the you-know-what because of the bike lanes everywhere. And now I hear they're going to block off part of, um, oh, is it Fury Street or one of the streets? Just the bike lane? Prime Road. Just the bike lanes again. Is that right? Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Isn't there something we can do to bring back the original plan where the bike lanes were meant to be off the main road because they're also destroying businesses with the hours they're there a whole lot? Yep. One of the first things that I did, Laurie, when I was campaigning, Sturt Street had a trial Copenhagen-style bike lane in it. And... Um, the, the residents and the businesses were all complaining that it removed car parks. The way it was designed, it actually collected rubbish and broken glass and water, and it, it, it wasn't working at all. So one of the first things that I enacted was through council to have that removed. So certainly, I think there needs to be a city-wide plan. At the moment, we've lost two lanes by putting the tram down the middle of King William. We've lost lanes along um, Grenfell Street in both directions for the bus lanes as well as East Terrace. So we need to look at a plan that if you keep removing lanes of cars, you still have the same amount of cars travelling in each direction. So unless you have a ring road that um, directs people around the city or just bike lanes that are used in just major corridors rather than on every street, uh, we need to really assess the traffic as a city-wide traffic solution. Yes, but as I said, bike lanes are originally meant, well, I believe for, you know, when I was feeling when they first started, are only going to be off the main road, not on main road. I guess through the city, the, the majority of the roads are main roads, unfortunately, but Frome Road, it, there are parts of Frome Road that um, a bike lane would suit, and there are other parts where it will make the road very congested for motorists. So. It, it's certainly something that I want to look into in more, more detail. Thank you for your call, Laurie. Rachel Sanderson, my guest in the studio this afternoon, taking your calls on 8223 0000. Hagen, Hagen. Talks everything Adelaide. Six months till the next state election and over the course of those months we will be inviting a series of state MPs and candidates into the studio to meet them because when they ask you uh, for your vote you'll need to know who you may be voting for and uh, we're inviting, we've invited Rachel Sanderson this afternoon but we'll be inviting uh, candidates and, and members of all political persuasions. 8223 We'll get to Zelco, Rachel, in just a moment but security in the city and North Adelaide uh, you're very concerned about? Yes, definitely. There was a, another attack on Brougham Place earlier, I think it was last Monday night at only 7.20 in the evening and that's the fifth attack in two years. So I'm very concerned about safety and as such, when Carmen Garcia was running for the federal seat of Adelaide, um, through her I spoke to her about my concerns and she had $255,000 allocated from the Tony Abbott Liberal government for CCTV cameras and better lighting throughout North Adelaide, particularly to help around the hospital as well as on O'Connell Street and the areas that we know there have been issues. This recent one, was it a young girl who was attacked or what happened? I think she might have been a, a student that lived at one of the residential colleges Gosh. and um, I think she was only early 20s or late teens. Mm. So it is an issue and I think that cameras are a great way of um, detecting 
people and also then following them up. If you've got good digital cameras, you can actually identify people. Mm. I've recently door knocked all of the businesses on O'Connell Street to see what footage they have, like what cameras actually are directed onto the street. So in the Jill Ma case, for example, it was the wedding shop camera that went out onto the street was that was vital in finding mm. her attacker and um, so now I've got a list that I've put together of their contact details so if there is any incident that we can get onto them straight away to check their footage and and know where the trouble spots are so that you know there there will be a working party that works out where the camera should go and at least I know where the cameras already are and where the trouble spots are from visiting the business owners. Great idea. Zelko is on the line. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies. Uh, I've just been listening to you speak, Rachel, and I think you're one of the few people that has actually hit the nail on the head on a, or about a lot of things uh, about Adelaide. But a couple of examples, I went to the city a couple of weeks ago with my wife, we haven't been for a while, and we got charged $17 to park the car for two and a half hours. For two and now, a half hours? Two and a half hours. Oh, now, that, that to me is absurd. It puts me off going to the city and you are right about the car parking. There isn't enough. And the Lord Mayor saying that we've got more car parks per head of population than any other city. Every other city in Australia has got a fantastic public transport system. We haven't. The only, the main thing we rely on in buses, and at the moment, you know, that there's a heap of trouble with them. Mm. We've only got four rail lines. We've got one tram line. And, you know, ideally, rail and tram is the way to go, not buses. And this is a big problem. And you can't compare Adelaide with other cities. And I think that they're of the mentality that, I mean, Adelaide's a beautiful place, don't get me wrong, but they try and compete with bigger cities with a bigger population and more money to spend on the city when they should really be looking at what they've got to work with and what appeals to the people of South Australia. Because we're, we think differently to the, to the rest of you know, mainland Australia. You're right. I think we should focus on being being good at being Adelaide and not worrying about Melbourne and Sydney. And clearly parking is an issue because it comes up regularly. The City Council did have a very good initiative, which unfortunately has ended because I ended up paying about $15 for two hours recently when I thought I was in a three hours for $6 car park. So that trial period has ended. But I think that was a very good initiative of Council to have three hour parking for six dollars because then it's aimed at the shoppers and that's who we want coming into the, into the city. Certainly people that um, are the early bird parkers are the people that you would try to encourage into public transport but you would do that by providing public transport that arrives on time and that is reliable and that you can get a seat and and that it is safe. So mm. we need to improve the public transport like you said before we expect people to, you know, leave their cars at home, we need to provide an alternative. We've seen in the past, in the in the Mike Rand, perhaps Michael Harbison, I think, days. I'm sure it was when Michael Harbison was the, the Lord Mayor. There was quite um, antagonism between state government and the Adelaide City Council. We don't seem to have that at the moment um, under Stephen Yarwood. If the Liberals got into power, how do you see um, a state government, Adelaide City Council relations? Is that is that important? Do you think that the, the two bodies get along? I think it's very important because we look after the same area. So I'm the, the member for Adelaide and that covers four different council areas of which the Adelaide City Council is a big part of that. So mm. none of my visions and none of their visions can happen unless we're on the same page and we're working together. And the same with having a, a federal member as well. So it is quite complicated because we would all have our own you know, views and we were all elected um, based on our views. So it is important that you, you work together for the best outcome. Six months out to the election, do you know yet who your uh, opponent will be? No, I don't. So I'm, yes, waiting. But I guess all I should really focus on is what I can do and, and you know, continue to work for my community and be aware of their needs and focus on how I can improve my local area. Certainly, you know, it is, it is a concern. You, everyone's interested to know who, you, who their opponent is but it shouldn't affect what I do anyway. Mm. Rachel Sanderson, great to have you in the studio. We look Thank forward you. to seeing you uh, a few more times before March. Fantastic. Thank you. We will be back in just a moment, 29 minutes past three.